Groom Lake, no Area 51. November 3, 2024. Howling winds rolled across the sunny desert, generating a bitter chill that betrayed the year-round desert scorch. Uniformed personnel hastened to secure hangar doors, a bulwark against the assault of the sand, while shutdowns were initiated across the base to safeguard the sensitive equipment that resided within. Yet amidst the escalating sandstorm, one particular hangar remained a buzzing hive of activity. A man clad in sand-colored combat fatigues grappled with his cap as he walked past the closing doors. Giving up, he grumbled. Ah, screw this before finally tucking the cap safely between his shirt and vest. A tap on his arm directed his attention upward to a familiar grin. Lieutenant Ron Owens, an imposing figure whose physical prowess could have comfortably secured him a spot on any NFL team, had instead opted for the Space Force. Whenever asked about his decision, his answer was unwavering. Adventure. Am on now, Henry. Aren't you excited? He questioned, his genuine enthusiasm contrasting with the professional atmosphere of the facility. Captain Henry Doniger looked past his friend, his eyes settling on a distant part of the hangar concealed by a complex array of hallways, labs, and modules. Excited. Excitement has been a no-show for the last 14 gate activations. Fool me once, right? Ron chuckled, clapping his friend on the shoulder. Look alive, Captain. Trust me. It's different this time. Just wait and see. They ventured deeper into the hangar-turned facility, weaving through a maze of scientific apparatus and military personnel. Eventually, they reached the heart of it, a gateway. The structure loomed over the surrounding space, imposing and mysterious. Resting upright upon a concrete platform, the semicircle stretched to at least half the length of the hangar, boasting a diameter large enough to fit a Boeing 747 with ease. Mysterious symbols, dubbed rune as is by the researchers, wove their intricate patterns around the ring's perimeter. The thick, transparent barriers surrounded the gateway alongside camera sensors and layers of defenses. Incredible awe struck Henry as he absorbed the scene. The mere presence of this enigmatic structure ignited a sense of thrilling anticipation within him, a taste of the adventure Ron so often spoke of. Ron leaned against a railing, his eyes similarly wide as he took in the sight. Would you look at that? It's like something out of a science fiction show. I've seen it dozens of times, and it still gets me, Henry admitted. He observed men and women in protective suits setting up computers and other gadgets by a large silvery box that echoed the arcane design of the ring. Though I don't think I've seen this many people around before. Ron's eyes settled on the figures moving about. They're looking a little more excited than we are. Look, he said, pointing at a group of lab-coated personnel huddled behind some consoles near the gate itself. They're already preparing to seal the ring just in case. Can't blame them, Henry mused, his eyes tracing the myriad of safety measures. Last thing we want is an alien plague on Earth. <laughs> Ron's laugh was genuine, but his eyes remained fixed on the gate. Or oh, bloodthirsty wannabe Romans! Henry turned towards Ron, his eyes peeling off from the alien structure for a moment. But seriously, Romans? There could be parasitic aliens masquerading as deities, lanky grey men. Hell, even dragons and shit. And your first thought is the Roman Empire. What kind of adventure you dream about when you signed up for the Space Force? That's... Look, Cap, not my idea, right? But there was this one anime. He paused for a moment. Japanese cartoon that depicts fantasy Romans pouring out of a portal just to get clapped by modern guns. Just a reference. Well, as long as it doesn't have any of those generic weeb harems and 500-year-old teen girls, I guess I won't judge your taste. <laughs> Ron looked to the side, his slight gesture slipping past Henry's radar. Anyway, the scientists say that the readings are more energetic than before and even managed to convince General Harding to come by and check it out. <laughs> Henry's skepticism returned as a half-smile. Really now? 
Ron raised his hands. Look, I've had doubts, but I think I've also had more faith. Besides, if Dr. Lamar thinks something's gonna happen for real, then it probably will. Yeah, dude. Henry sighed, conceding. I guess you do have a point there. His eyes drifted over toward a tall blonde woman in a white coat, assisting the other researchers. After pointing at a screen, she paused and looked up at the ring, catching Henry staring at her from the railing. Henry gave a wave and a smile, feeling satisfied as she returned the friendly gesture before going back to work. Ron nudged him teasingly. Got your eye on Dr. Lombard, have you? Watch it, he replied, though his grin belied his feigned irritation. She's the top scientist here, aside from Director Lombard herself. Helps to have friends in smart places. The air in the hangar tightened as the transparent barriers sealed the gateway, trapping it in a fortified containment chamber. The last of the technicians cleared the area, leaving only a quiet hum from the computers and a charged atmosphere crackling with the potential of the unknown. But Times like this, I wish we knew more about those who built this thing, Ron admitted, his voice dropping to a contemplative tone. What were they like? Why'd they leave? Henry shook his head, his gaze fixed on the now-contained gate and the automated defenses around it. Maybe we'll find out soon. If what they're saying is true, we might be on the brink of something big here. A voice over the intercom interrupted their conversation. All personnel, please report to your stations. Gate activation will commence in T-1 hour. Ron glanced at Henry, then the platform above. There, overlooking the bustling hangar, loomed a figure obscured by the sharp light framing the control room's glass. The stern posture and hands, clasped behind his back, were undeniably those of General Alexander Harding. But next to him, a slender figure watched the preparations with an almost giddy expression. Dr. Andromeda Lombard, the director of the Manifest Project. Looks like the director's excited too. Ron observed. Henry followed Ron's gaze, then shook his head, a wry smile tugging at his lips. She may be excited, but I'll believe it when I see it. Let's get to our stations. It's almost showtime. General Harding gazed out the control room's window, eyes narrowing at the array of technical equipment and personnel in motion. Dr. Lombard joined him, tablet in hand, displaying a complex graph of energy signatures. General, the gate's energy pattern has shifted. Oscillations at frequencies never before recorded. Look at this waveform. It suggests a resonance with an external source. Well, Harding's focus shifted to the screen, his brow furrowing at the indecipherable dance of spikes and troughs. So we finally established a two-way connection. Lombard's voice quivered with controlled excitement. Yes, MRD-7 is in position with a range of sensors for environmental analysis. With Harding set his jaw. This is a significant assertion, Director. Top brass won't be too pleased with another false alarm. She looked him in the eye. I'm positive. We've been over the data repeatedly. This isn't a glitch. The gate is responding to something tangible. He studied her a moment before nodding. All right. We proceeded with caution. At the first sign of irregularity, I want the gate shut down. Wait. Understood. She responded, her expression resolute. We'll follow procedures to the letter. They looked out over the hangar once more. The preparations were visible in every corner. Technicians double-checking the Mar D-7 recon drones instrumentation, soldiers in place around the secure perimeter, and scientists huddled around monitors. Harding's voice broke the silence. Let's move to the briefing. <laughs> Everything's ready, she wondered, referring to the defensive procedure. Everything's in place, Harding answered, reaching the briefing room's doors. He pushed them open, stepping into a room filled with key military and civilian personnel. All eyes turned to them, the room's atmosphere tense with anticipation. The men and women present joining in through several video feeds consisted of the nation's elite, barring the president and vice president themselves, 
Secretary of State Thompson, Secretary of Defense Morgan, other top-ranking officers, leading scientists in theoretical physics and astrophysics, and government liaisons. Ah. General Harding took his place at the head of the table, giving everyone a moment to settle. His eyes scanned the room, recognizing a few who'd been in the Manifest Project since day one, Ambassador John Perry, the designated representative for first contact, and Oliver Freeman, known for his work on interstellar anomalies. As you all know, Harding began, we're at a critical juncture with the Manifest Project. Today, we are potentially stepping into something entirely new. Next to him. Lombard shifted her weight and motioned to a presentation of charts. We've conducted simulations, analyzed every possible scenario, but reality could be quite different. It's a threshold we've never crossed before. A liaison, seated a few chairs down, tapped his pen on his notebook. General, this could very well be humanity's greatest achievement or its worst disaster. The safety measures must be impenetrable. Agreed, Harding reassured, resting his elbows on the table. The multi-phase safety protocol has been implemented and the Recon Rover, Pathfinder one, is equipped with the latest sensor technology, including biohazard detection. Lombard picked up a remote and cycled through a few more visual aids. Not just biohazards. We've prepared for atmospheric, radiological and other environmental risks. Secretary of State Thompson leaned forward, his screen filling up with his face. How are the first contact preparations coming along? With Ambassador Perry responded, linguistic and cultural experts are all ready. We have several communication strategies depending on the situation at hand. All right then, Thompson finally said. Let us now proceed to discuss first contact protocols and possible outcomes. As the meeting's participants readied their documents, shuffling papers and scrolling through their tablets, Thompson continued, It's been a while since we went through this, so let's go over it again. Uh, Director, perhaps you can start with an outline of the communication plan? Lombard scrolled to the relevant section of her presentation, showcasing a flowchart. Certainly. Pathfinder 1 will initially gather data on the other side. If intelligent life is detected, the recon rover has equipment to capture audio and visual cues. We'll start with a nonverbal approach, observing and analyzing any signals, patterns, or behaviors. Perry picked up. If we establish that there is a complex communication system, we'll initiate slow and controlled attempts at interaction. Symbols, sounds, and basic mathematical concepts. What if things turn hostile? The liaison asked. He interlocked his fingers and leaned in. Harding answered the question plainly. We are prepared for that scenario, though it's a last resort. Any trouble, we'll shut the experiment down right away. If push somehow comes to shove, they'll have to get through vacuum, hardened barriers, automated defenses, and a company's worth of firepower all aimed at the gate. The liaison pressed further, and all personnel are briefed on the necessary protocols. Thoroughly, Harding confirmed. Every member of this project knows their role and the steps to be taken at each phase. Morgan nodded, addressing the room. Then we have our plan. Ambassador Perry, General Harding, Director Lombard, on behalf of President Keener, we trust you to lead this delicate task with wisdom and restraint. You hold the keys not only to changing the fate of this country, but also of humanity. Now go and make history. Good luck and God bless. Henry shifted his weight, the tactile fabric of his environmental suit adjusting with him. He glanced at the M7 rifle in his hands. Its weight seemed to have subtly increased, as if burdened by the gravity of the mission. His earlier skepticism, once as pervasive as background radiation, had largely decayed. A sudden chime echoed above, followed by an automated announcement. Gate activation in two minutes. And so, this is it, Henry began, voice taut but tinged with a wisp of irreverence. Two minutes until we either make history or become a cautionary tale. Ron chuckled softly. 
Yeah, no pressure, right? Just another day at the office. Henry smirked. You ever think we'd be here doing this? About to activate a portal to... Lord knows where. I always thought we'd be doing halo jumps or fighting commies on the moon. If you told high school me about this, I'd say you've got your chevrons locked in all the wrong places. Henry nodded, gaze drifting back to the increasingly busy control room. You know, part of me still wonders if this is just an elaborate, overfunded LARP session. If it is, they've got killer production values. For real. Well, Henry sighed, checking the chamber of his M7 one last time. Let's just hope the only thing we meet on the other side is an alien deer or something. I can deal with that. Agreed, Ron replied. Anything's better than running into kaijus or eldritch horrors. Henry's eyes flicked back to Ron. You ready? As I'll ever be. Another chime broke through. Gate activation in ten. Nine. Eight. The gate began to hum, the pitch rising steadily, synchronizing almost organically with the countdown. Concentric rings of light on the gate's frame began to illuminate one by one, forming a radiant cascade toward the center. Each glowing ring separated itself from the main structure, beginning to rotate in the air. Their harmonious interplay spun threads of light that zigzagged across the rings. Geometric shapes materialized. Pentagons, hexagons, intricate spirals, as if etched by unseen hands. They moved with a curious blend of mechanical precision and organic fluidity, aligning in a sequence that seemed to straddle the realms of both precise mathematics and arcane symbols. Six, five, four. The hum escalated into a whirring resonance as the luminous rings accelerated. The inscriptions and runes transformed into flowing streams of light, the patterns locking into place as if turning the tumblers of a cosmic lock. The atmosphere itself seemed to become a denser medium, charged by an unknown energy. Three, two, one. Th Finally, the gate's rotating ring seemed to reach a point of equilibrium. A burst of light erupted so radiant that Henry and Ron reflexively squinted despite the protective visors of the helmets. The clusters of brightness pulsed, sending a wave of shimmering energy toward the center of the gate. As it collided with the intricate shapes forming within the rings, a chain reaction was triggered. Each arcane sigil augmented by the incoming energy, amplifying their collective potency and setting the stage for the unfolding vortex. The portal shimmered into existence, its surface an ever-changing tapestry of iridescent hues, cerulean, emerald, amethyst, yet all bathed in an encompassing celestial silver glow. At irregular intervals, fractal patterns flickered on its surface, reminiscent of the arcane circles, only to dissolve back into the pool of light. It was, in all senses of the word, mesmerizing. Connection is stable. No irregularities detected, Lombard announced over comms. Stanby for rover deployment, Harding's voice echoed next, his tone tinged with an undercurrent of anticipation, a rare but justifiable divergence from his usual character. Henry and Ron watched a monitor on their console that showed a live feed from the rover's cameras. Ahead, the rover lurched forward, slowly rolling into the portal. And destiny makes history, Ron muttered. For a split second, the camera feed fuzzed, a kaleidoscope of swirling colors and fluid geometries colliding with one another. It was as if the rover had plunged into a whirlpool made of liquid light and fragmented space, a sensation that defied the laws of physics Henry knew. Then, abruptly as it started, the chaos ceased and the view stabilized. The rover emerged into a landscape so picturesque it looked stolen from a painting. Rolling meadows dressed in vibrant hues of green stretched out as far as its cameras could capture, punctuated by bursts of wildflowers that bobbed gently in the wind. Distant mountains stood in the background, majestic and imposing all the same. The sky above held a clarity rarely seen on Earth, 
a near-perfect azure with wisps of cotton-like clouds meandering lazily. Juxtaposed against the lush plains were ruins not of stone and mortar. Instead, they looked wrought from a metallic substance Henry couldn't identify. Their surfaces adorned with intricate geometric patterns and clean lines that shimmered as if enchanted. Curves and angles harmonized in their architecture, reflecting the design of the gate. Ethereal light trails connected fragmented platforms, some of which hovered unnaturally above the ground, as if the laws of gravity were suggestions rather than rules. As the rover ventured further, its optics refocused to capture anomalous movement ahead. Emerging from the tree line adjacent to the ruins, figures appeared. They were clearly prepared, their formation suggesting they'd been awaiting something. Perhaps the gateway's activation. Knights stood at the ready, their armor similar to the gray of steel, but more vibrant. Their shields bore glowing intricate designs, resonating with a hidden energy. Alongside them stood individuals in robes, wielding staffs crowned with orbs or gemstones emitting a faint awe. Mages. The mages murmured incantations or manipulated incantations or manipulated their artifacts as if in tune with an energy field that the rover's sensors couldn't quantify. Clearly, they had their own procedures and protocols. The silence and anticipation in the hangar gave way to a torrent of hushed murmurs, ranging from excitement about the fantastical humans before them to disappointment from those expecting something more unique. At the forefront of this assembly was a singular figure. His blue robe was a tapestry of symbols and patterns, intricately woven in silver threads that captured and refracted light. At this side, a staff featured a central gem similar to, but grander than those of his companions. But even through the mechanical detachment of the rover's lens, it was palpable. This was a man of immense influence and uncanny ability. Leadership identified, Henry stated. Go to FP Con Charlie, Harding's voice interjected, the weight of his words cutting through the awe-inspiring visuals. Keep your weapons at condition three. Unknown entities ahead. We cannot assume intent. Mr. Ambassador, stand by for first contact. All units be prepared for contingencies. Henry's fingers danced across his console, toggling the rover's defense systems to a higher readiness level. A sidebar on the screen blinked from green to amber, aligning with the FP Keycon change. He glanced at Ron, who had already fine-tuned the focus of the secondary cameras, prepping them for rapid movement and target acquisition. Ambassador Perry your console is activated, Lombard announced her voice surprisingly steady. Perry's hands hovered momentarily above the interface, as if savoring the weight of the moment. He engaged the console and scooted his seat inward, taking a deep breath. Across the room, the techs exchanged glances. They'd had just elevated from routine operation to an uncharted domain. Some seemed on the verge of celebratory cheers, while others remained cautious of their first glance at interstellar life. All eyes returned to the live feed plastered across various screens throughout the hangar. Proceed, Harding finally intoned. Harry! The drone's wheels crunched over the foreign yet familiar soil, inching closer to the gathering of knights and wizards. Expressions of bewilderment flickered across their features, morphing gradually into ones of intense curiosity, reverence, or fear. At the head of the group, the archmage's eyes narrowed. His staff came up, not in a threatening manner, but more like a conductor gauging the rhythm of an orchestra. He said something, perhaps a soft incantation, and the gem at the apex of his staff glowed momentarily. Not, it was as though he were probing the drone, perhaps seeking to understand its nature or origin. Optical and thermal sensors are still nominal, a nearby tech reported. No signs of jamming or interference. Henry prepared to engage at the slightest hint of hostility, but nothing of the sort came. Instead, the knights and wizards seemed to defer to their leader who, after a lingering gaze, lowered his staff and took a deliberate step back. 
It looks like they're giving us room, Henry noted, feeling the room exhale, a collective sigh of withheld breath. Parry moistened his lips, his finger hovering over the console, initiating first contact sequence. With a press, the rover's external projection system whirred to life. A low hum filled the air as it projected a simple square onto the grassy ground that lay between the rover and the locals. The archmage looked at the shape, then back at his assembly, an unspoken dialogue passing through glances and subtle gestures. He flourished his staff with a fluid movement, its gem glowing once more. A similar square took form, conjured out of thin air, hovering above the projection on the ground. It fit over the original square with such precision that it was as if a blueprint had been laid atop an architect's model. Incredible, Lombard whispered, eyes widening. No hostile body language detected, Harding's voice cut in, a hint of relief colouring his usually stony tone. Continue with the protocol. The atmosphere in the control room shifted perceptibly, like a taut wire suddenly given slack. What they'd seen wasn't merely a return gesture. It was a mirror, a recognition that spanned worlds and just made history. Ambassador Perry began the next sequence, a hopeful, almost boyish smile touching his lips. The projection switched from shapes to simple dots of light. One dot appeared first, followed by two dots, then three. The archmage seemed to deliberate for a moment, his eyes moving between his staff and the projection. With another elegant motion, the gem at his staff's pinnacle flared to life. Blue dots materialized in the air, counting upward from one to ten. A collective breath filled the control room. After letting the dots linger for a moment, Perry moved on to the next sequence. He pressed another key, and the projection shifted into a sequence of dots and symbols to signify basic addition. Two dots appeared, then a cross, followed by two more dots. A line of parallel dashes came next, and finally four dots filled the space. Arch the Archmage watched intently before waving his staff once more. His own dots and symbols came to life, perfectly replicating Perry's sequence. Three plus four equals seven. Uh, basic addition, Lombard said, the giddiness in her voice swelling. We've just communicated basic arithmetic across worlds. All right, Harding beckoned. Let's take it up a notch. With another keystroke, the projection transformed. A triangle materialized, its sides demarcated by dots. Three on one side, four on another, and the hypotenuse conspicuously empty. For the first time since the interaction began, the archmage hesitated. His eyes squinted, narrowing as if caught in a riddle. The gem on his staff dimmed for a brief moment, then flared back to life as though echoing its master's fluctuating certain. The moment stretched, every second a mallet strike on the drum of tension in the control room. Then, with a motion almost casual, he waved his staff. Five dots appeared along the previously empty hypotenuse. Holy shit, Henry muttered. Incredulous. Ron nodded, equally stunned. He understands the Pythagorean theorem. The archmage then did something unexpected. With a few more waves of his staff, he conjured up a series of dots and symbols using a circle to represent multiplication. Three times, three plus four times, four is equal to five times five. He then drew a new triangle, its individual sides containing five, twelve, and thirteen dots followed by the respective formula. Ta he knows, Lombard exclaimed, nearly jumping out of her seat. He's not just repeating what we're showing, he's expanding on it. <laughs> the personnel in the room shared varying levels of surprise at the groundbreaking interaction they had just witnessed, reflected in a chorus of gasps, wows, and excited chatter. Harding's neutral tone seemed to gain an edge of wonder. Record the data for immediate analysis and keep the interaction going. What's the next step in the protocol? One. Mathematics seems a universal language Perry observed, already initiating the next phase. We'll transition to basic physics and chemistry before tackling linguistics.
The projection changed again, a simple lever appearing with a fulcrum, effort, and load represented by varying numbers of docks. A straightforward concept, but a building block to more complex ideas. The archmage waved his staff, nascent blue particles swirling in the air and coalescing into an image. But before the conjuration could solidify, the rover's external microphone spiked with a distant shout. The archmage's eyes shot to the side, out of the camera's field of view, and the fledgling image collapsed, its particles disappearing into the ether. Abruptly, a knight blurred into the rover's camera frame. His pace was too fast, supernaturally so, as if the armor were woven from air rather than metal. The knight decelerated with such abruptness that dust plumes rose at his feet. He skidded to a halt beside the archmage, planting his boots firmly and pulling him to the side. The archmage resisted momentarily, spitting out rapid-fire syllables in their native tongue, unintelligible to parry. But when a muffled explosion boomed in the distance, the archmage ceased his protests and abandoned his progress with the rover. Relenting, he followed the knight, sprinting toward the growing clamor. Rovers picking up additional contacts, numbering in the low hundreds, coming in fast from the east. About a click out. Possible hostiles closing on the contact site, Henry reported. Harding leaned into the microphone, his voice echoing through the intercom. All units prepare for contingency plan Delta II. Ambassador, halt the protocol. Director, status on environmental safety? <laughs> Rover data shows atmosphere is 74 nitrogen, 25 oxygen, on 80 other trace gases. Gravity is 1 g Earth normal. All filters for biological, chemical, and radiological hazards are green. Lombard rattled off, eyes scanning the multiple data streams on her screen. Confirmed. No immediate environmental threats, Harding noted. Ambassador Perry. Prep to resume first contact once the area is secured. Your Enviro suit is on standby. Understood. General. Perry acknowledged. Watching the situation unfold on the other side, Henry and Ron executed a swift status check alongside a platoon of personnel under their command. All systems green suits at 100. Weapons at condition one, Henry confirmed. Copy that, Ron ensured his rifle was completely prepared for combat and fingers ready to flick the safety off. Whoa! Yeah! After a chorus of confirmations from their platoon, Harding issued the final command, you are cleared to proceed. Remember, row applies here. Minimal force to neutralize threats. Exercise caution. The locals may not recognize your weapons. We're not just representing America. We're representing Earth. Prepare for barrier disengagement, he announced. I... You... A technician carried out Harding's command. A series of mechanical clunks and groans resonated throughout the room as heavy blast doors and other security measures started to retract. One by one. Deploy Ujivest to lead the entry, Harding ordered. Operators immediately engaged their control systems. Heavily armed, unmanned ground vehicles rolled through the portal. Screen feeds lit up across the room, showing first glimpses of an alien terrain. Henry and Ron followed suit, approaching the swirling gateway. Ah. Godspeed, Harding said, a note of hope coloring his voice. Ah. With that, Henry led his team into the gateway. One moment he was outlined in the vortex of light. The next, gone. Ron and the others followed, swallowed by the unknown. Henry felt as if he had been hurled through a wall of ice-cold water, every sense momentarily numbed. Just as quickly, he found himself grounded, boots hitting a stone platform leading up to the hilltop gateway. The portal's glow faded behind them, its radiance swallowed by a different sort of luminescence, a serene natural daylight. Security platoon Zulu-9 sound off, Henry called out as he secured the perimeter. Ron rested his hands on his knees. A bit queasy, but all good. Two. Good to go. 
Another member said, Three, all clear. The roll call continued crisply as the members took in the scenery. Seeing it in person was a different beast compared to seeing it on the screens back at the base. On the ground, the blue skies seemed brighter, the landscape more idyllic. Juxtaposing this view was a set of sleek ruins and something far less idyllic. Distance to the combat zone? Henry questioned, the word sounding inadequate even as he said it. About 400 meters, sir, one of the men answered. Henry zoomed in using his visor, the rangefinder confirming the distance. He squinted, trying to make out the individual elements of the conflict below. He saw the knights and wizards from before facing off against some sort of creature. Some of them were agile and small, scurrying on four legs covered in greenish scales. Others were larger and muscular, taking to the sky for brief seconds with leathery wings, and then there were the big ones, towering and dragon-like, circling above the mayhem, occasionally swooping down like birds of prey and laying bursts of fire. What the fuck? Henry heard one of his men mutter over comms, disbelief, leaking through the helmet. Everyone had their fair share of comments, likening the scene to everything fantasy, from dungeons and dragons to a smattering of more plays and anime. As Henry and his platoon assessed the situation, the battlefield lit up with mystical flames and roared with earth-shattering cries. Knights clad in intricately designed plate armor stood their ground, almost glowing as they clashed with the scaled creatures. Around them, Individuals dressed in robes conjured an array of elemental spells, offering both offense and defense in coordinated maneuvers. What in the world is happening down there? Someone carrying a grenade launcher muttered. Looks like a renaissance fair gone horribly wrong. Yeah, except renaissance fairs don't usually include artillery, Ron added noticing bursts of fire arcing through the air and crashing into clusters of the smaller, greenish creatures. The explosions were followed by a chorus of what they could only describe as otherworldly shrieks. The knights were remarkable in their own right. They moved with agility on par with that of an Olympic sprinter, despite their heavy armor, delivering blows that seemed unnaturally powerful, cleaving through the tough scales of the larger creatures. Some performed leaps that carried them several meters across the battlefield, landing amid a throng of enemies only to reposition swiftly and strike. Uh, now, this is what I'd expect a Warcraft movie to look like, whispered one of the younger members of Zulu-9. Fucking crazy. The magical support was even more bewildering. From his vantage point, Henry noticed spikes of earth suddenly emerging from the ground, impaling smaller creatures. Patches of the land seemed to freeze instantaneously, causing creatures to stumble and brilliant shields of translucent energy materialized around clusters of knights, deflecting the fiery breath of the larger dragon-like entities. Several mages at a distance from the main battle raised their staffs skyward. A series of brilliant flares burst into the sky, exploding into showers of sparkling light. The larger, winged creatures recoiled, some tumbling from the sky in disoriented spirals. Suddenly, the air seemed to ripple with energy. Henry watched as a handful of mages and knights converged, their hands and weapons glowing as if sharing energy. What happened next was straight out of a legend. A vortex of fire and air, a swirling tornado of flames, erupted from the gathered group, surging forward to consume dozens of the scaled creatures in its... Despite the grand displays of magical and martial prowess, the monstrous horde seemed largely unaffected. It was clear that the knights and wizards were faltering, the beasts winning this battle of attrition. And Henry broke their trance. All right, Zulu-9. We're looking at real people, yeah? Yeah, okay, and real monsters. Down there. The entities down there resemble knights and wizards, but under Complan Delta II, they qualify as diplomatic personnel. Our mandate is to protect them and offer tactical assistance to stabilize the situation. I 
They may react with hostility, sir. How are we supposed to communicate? Someone asked. We've got our own universal language. Firepower and backup, Henry's confident reply came. We're going to get down there, assist them, and hope to God they're smart enough to realize we're friendlies. No offensive actions against anything human-shaped or resembling those knights and wizards, unless they fire first. Copy delineating friend from foe based on visual parameters. Another man said, relaying the information back to the drone operators. And let's get the rover active, Henry added. They didn't attack it before. Maybe seeing it fighting alongside us will hammer home the point that we're allies. The rover joined them in response, small turrets on its chassis prepared to fire. The UAGVs took flanking positions, their weapons systems armed but holding fire. The rover lumbered ahead of them, its armaments trained on advancing beasts that broke away from the main horde. Meanwhile, the men on the ground moved like clockwork, squads fanning out in a loose line perpendicular to the threat ahead. Ah. Enemy contact, 400 meters, multiple ground and airborne targets coming in from the tree line. The fire control order jolted through Zulu 9's comms. Henry didn't hesitate. Weapons free. Psa! Gunfire erupted from the line in a cacophony of controlled chaos. As Henry pulled the trigger, the rifle recoiled in his arms, each 6.8 round whizzing through the air and finding its mark among the charging, scaled creatures. La la! The effects of the projectiles were immediate and destructive, the hides and scales not meant to withstand anything stronger than arrows. Two of the smaller creatures skidded and toppled over, legs jerking in post-mortem spasms. Reloading! Henry's shout was almost drowned out by the continuous rattle of machine guns and the deeper booms of the UGV's autocannons. He ejected the spent magazine and slammed a fresh one in, the metallic clink echoing in the air as he chambered the first round. Bah! The UGVs contributed more than their fair share to the cacophony. Their thirty auto cannons roared, each explosive round impacting the field with ferocity, turning earth and creature alike into a mist of blood and soil. Alongside this mechanized onslaught, the platoon's machine gunners set their M250s to work, sending a torrent of lead into the mass of attackers. The machine guns fired non-stop, their barrels growing hot as they sent a relentless stream of bullets at the mass of enemies us on the larger ones. Those things look like pack leaders, Henry ordered, watching as one resisted the impact of several rounds. Roger that, sir. Adjusting targets came the calm reply from one of the snipers. A moment later, a high-caliber round cracked through the air. One of the larger, lion-sized creatures let out an ear-piercing shriek as part of its body was torn off. Henry's gaze then shifted back to the Archmage's forces. The knights and mage, initially startled by the onslaught of familiar weaponry, now regained their composure. They knew that aid, however peculiar, was here. A staff rose into the air, its tip growing brightly before releasing a beacon of light into the sky. A flare, Henry inferred. A cry for reinforcement, or perhaps... Acknowledgement. Ah. Davis, he turned to one of his men, send up a counter flare. Let them know we see them and we're with them. The American flare ascended, meeting the arcane light of the Archmage's spell and breaking through the language barrier. With the understanding of support realized by the locals, Henry returned to the battle at hand. He glanced at his HUD as new icons appeared, highlighting airborne targets that veered from the Archmage's position. It was none other than the dragon-like monstrosities that dwarfed their terrestrial kin, flocking toward their greatest threat. Aim for the eyes or wind joints Ron transmitted, falling back on fragmented lore from fantasy media back home. Copy. Targeting vulnerabilities. A sniper responded. I... Adjusting to the aerial threat, Henry issued a new command. Ugzi switched to anti-air. Light those dragons up! 
The autocannons on the UGVs whirred as they tilted upwards, redirecting fire from the beasts below to the threats above. They rattled off volleys of 30 rounds and sent waves of sacklos missiles from their customized pods, filling the sky with a discordant symphony of whirring machinery and explosive munitions. The dragon-like entities roared in a mixture of fury and pain, veering erratically but vainly. As the 30 morounds made contact, the effects were devastating. The dragons, or whatever they were, wailed in fury and agony, their roars piercing even the clamor of machinery and explosions. Those cries became increasingly erratic as they were buffeted by the incoming ordnance. The many magical barriers or scales that once shielded them rapidly disintegrated under the barrage. Roar! Unprotected flesh was laid bare, torn open by each new round and missile. One beast found its wing torn off by a direct missile hit, the resulting imbalance sending it tumbling out of the sky like a faltering kite. Another took a missile straight to its midsection, resulting in a gut-wrenching fireball that showered its kin below with viscera. The overkill was evident. These were weapons designed for armoured vehicles and aircraft, not creatures of myth and scale. Henry watched as the tide finally turned. The smaller creatures, many no larger than wolves but deadlier in their own rights, halted their advance. What had been a wave of malevolence now fractured into a scattered, disorderly retreat. Like water pulled by an unseen force, they ebbed away, retreating into the dark embrace of the surrounding forests. Ceasefire, Henry finally ordered, his voice edged with caution. Zulu-9, prepare for the next phase. A subtle release of tension flowed through Henry's muscles. The first critical phase was over. They had successfully completed the directives of Contingency Plan Delta II and protected the Archmage's men. His gaze shifted to the Archmage and his cadre, who were staring back with a range of emotions. Awe, relief, confusion, and suspicion. Among them, the Archmage stepped forward, as if ready to begin talks. It was one thing to repel an enemy attack. It was another to navigate this uncharted social terrain. With a hand signal, Henry motioned for his men to regroup before climbing onto the rover. With a smooth hum, they descended the hill toward the waiting archmage. As the rover came to a gentle stop, Henry disembarked. He walked up to the archmage, the servos in his Envero suit whirring faintly. The fine details seemed to grow louder. He was acutely aware of the weight of his own gear, the rifle slung across his chest, and the numerous eyes, both familiar and foreign. Watching him, a blend of excitement, trepidation, and pride swelled within him. Here he was, at the threshold of Earth's first interstellar contact. The Archmage shared a glance with his knights and mages, giving a subtle nod. The staffs, dimmed as their arcane energy disappeared into the air, and the knights returned their swords to their scabbards with a synchronized metallic slide. The archmage then extended his staff toward the earth, tracing two identical rune-laden circles on the ground. He stepped into one of them and made a gesture toward the vacant one, eyes locking onto Henry. His earpiece vibrated. Captain, what's your status? Harding asked. We saw the locals lower their... Sir, first contact remains non-hostile so far, Henry reported, keeping his eyes on the Archmage. He's created some kind of red magic circle. Looks like an invitation, or a test. Could be their method of communication or some ritual for trust? Harding hesitated for a brief moment. Standard protocol recommends we wait for Dr. Anderson and the linguistic team to take the lead. But... Director Lombard interjected, This could be an unprecedented opportunity for diplomatic relations. General, a groundbreaking moment for humanity. Their peaceful reaction to our rover, especially after it aided them in battle, indicates that we might be missing an invaluable diplomatic opportunity if we hesitate now. General Harding sighed audibly, We should err on the side of caution, but you're right. 
The fact they accepted our aid and lowered their weapons does speak to potential friendliness. Biz Ambassador Perry, who had been silently listening, finally spoke. What? Well, what's the risk-benefit here, General? It wouldn't make sense for the locals to backstab us after all that's happened. Moreover, with Captain Doniger having actively participated in combat, he has most likely gained a level of standing among them. Cultural norms could make it critical for him to make the first move. Wouldn't you normally be the one to initiate first contact? Harding asked, directing the question to the ambassador. In any other circumstance, yes, Perry responded. But Henry has the situational awareness here, and I don't want to risk ruining this by stepping in and possibly creating a cultural faux pas like appearing to withdraw our champion at a crucial moment. Captain Doniger has discretionary authority as far as I'm concerned. But I agree with the ambassador, Lombard said. <laughs> Harding relented very well. Captain, you've been given discretionary authority. It's your call. Henry looked at the Archmage's earnest face and the red magical circle beneath him. Then he glanced back at his men, silhouetted against the iridescent light show behind them. The call was his, and now the weight of the world fell upon his shoulders. The One small step, Ron murmured, voicing the opening phrase of a quote that had once bridged another frontier. Henry grinned, feeling the weight and wonder of the moment. One giant leap, he replied, stepping into the circle. Tweet. 